Uh, hi, my name is John McCall, and I'm going to be talking to you about uh, introducing a memory safe successor language into large code bases. Uh, I'm going to, as the agenda, I'm going to start by talking about the Apple ecosystem and the languages that we've historically used and where we see Swift fitting into that. Uh, I'm going to talk about why we think it's so important to use a successor language, the ways in which Swift's language design specifically meet our goals, but those should be fairly generalizable to other languages. Uh, and then I'll talk about ways in which Swift makes it easy to uh, migrate incrementally to it. Um, I want to start, though, by introducing myself. Uh, I'm new to this particular slice of the community. Uh, I've started at Apple in 2008 and joined the Clang project a year later. So this is, I think, my first commit, which is adding checks to see whether main returns int. So that's the state of Clang in 2009. <laughs> uh, and that's where I started. I helped bring up C++ in Clang. Um, so this is yet another fix to uh, name lookup. There is about a million of these, but I wrote a lot of them. Uh, eventually, I became a code owner of Clang's LVM IR generation, and still am. I still do a lot of code review on Clang. Uh, here, I am just wildly breaking the ABI because we thought it was a good idea. Uh, the maintainers of the Itanium C++ ABI didn't have time to keep up with the mailing list at some point, and so I took over as editor, which I still am. Uh, and more or less immediately stopped having time to keep up with the mailing list. So, <laughs> <laughs> inevitable cycle. Uh, more on the Apple side, I helped add automatic memory management to Objective C, which of course is a major safety win, as well as pointer authentication to ARM64, which is a major security mitigation. Uh, I was one of the first engineers to work on Swift and still work on Swift today. And, and now in particular, I am the chair of the language evolution group at, over at Swift. So to summarize, I've been working on predecessor languages for a long time. I'm very invested in them. Uh, I've done a, I'm very aware of a lot of the issues in these languages. I've done a lot of work to fix and mitigate those problems. I've also done a lot of work in successor languages and understand what makes a successor language good. So let me quickly overview uh, the predecessor languages in our ecosystem. We really have four predecessor languages. This is how we think of it. I assume that you're all familiar with C and C++. Objective-C is a language extension to C that adds a simple small talk style object system, which happens to be very good at defining stable APIs. And then uh, Objective-C adds some things to C, and so does C++. What they add is fairly orthogonal, so it's possible to use both of them in a single <coughs> translation unit. Uh, we call that mode Objective-C++. And this is especially useful when you need to use libraries written in really any combination of these systems. When we talk about the code ecosystem, most of the low-level code on Apple platforms, like pretty much everywhere else, is written in C. Uh, we have quite a bit of code, of course, on our ecosystem that's not just for Apple platforms. That includes the BSD stack, uh, the L things, projects like the LVM project and Clang, uh, and WebKit, and so on. Uh, this code tends to be written in either C or C++. Since C++ isn't a very good language for defining stable APIs, any C++ libraries here tend to uh, either not be part of the platform SDK, or they expose a very carefully curated API in either C or Objective-C. Platform-specific libraries, of which we've got a ton, can be written in any of our languages. But for similar reasons to the portable libraries, they only expose APIs to the SDK in C or Objective-C. <coughs> The UI libraries in particular are written in Objective-C or provide an Objective-C API. Uh, and therefore, UI apps in particular have to be written in at least Objective-C. They often are written in Objective-C++ so that they also can build in a C++ portable library, such as WebKit. Now, of course, if you look at the entire ecosystem, quite a lot of the code in, the, in, these, bo in these boxes in particular is not written by Apple. And we mostly see the languages used the same way as we use them at Apple. 
you have portable cores that are written in C and C++ with platform-specific UI layers written on top of them in Objective-C and Objective-C++. Now, where does Swift fit into this? You've probably heard of Swift as an app development language, uh, as a replacement to Objective-C. But Apple is very serious about making Swift a viable successor language everywhere on this chart. Uh, that's because we feel that we need a successor language everywhere on this chart. So we are putting Swift at the kernel and below, and as well as in platform libraries at, and not just UI applications. And we think that's a really important feature for the language, and we're very committed to it. I forgot to click the animation. So in order to work in all these places, we have a bunch of requirements for a successor language. The first requirement is that we really do want to focus on adding one new language. Uh, every language that we support uh, comes with a lot of implicit extra overhead in terms of tooling, in terms of UI support, like uh, Xcode editor support, build system support, and so on, as well as just language problems with making them interoperate. So we have four predecessor languages. We do not want four successor languages. Second, uh, we really want that successor language to be accessible enough to be usable as a first programming language. A lot of people coming into our platform are you know, coming in to, do, to make an app, something like that. They often are not experienced programmers. We want people to be able to come in and maybe learn to program in Swift, right? At the same time, of course, if we're going to fit into things like the kernel or coprocessor support code, we have to provide enough control to work in environments like that. Uh, and that means, in particular, that we uh, need to be able to scale down to a minimal runtime. We can't have a virtual machine. We can't have like a heap scanning garbage collector or anything like that. And furthermore, we need to be able to achieve respectable high performance without something the sport of something like a JIT, right? That's you know obviously just um, completely off the table for you know uh, hard embedded systems like running on the secure enclave. It's uh, also not a good high performance system for things like for considerations like battery life and power draw for just for UI applications, because it's very important that we be able to rapidly get to high efficiency code. So I mentioned before that Apple sees a need for a successor language in all of these places. It's reasonable to ask why. What's so bad with these predecessor languages? Uh, and so I thought that we'd start by making a list of all the problems with C. <laughs> so um, I think I know what's on the top of everybody's mind about the most important problem with C. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wanted to start with this to make a point. Um, function pointer syntax is actually a problem. Like uh, I'm sure we're all familiar <clears throat> with the C Duckle tool. There's also a C Duckle dot org. Like this syntax, it's not great. Right, like it actually is a point of confusion for people, like learning the language, remembering to use the language. People go back and forth between languages all the time. They find it frustrating to have something that they can't really wrap their head around. So declarator syntax actually is a significant obstacle. Um, there's a lot of other things that I would kind of put in this rough category. These are real problems with the language. Like uh, they're they're not great, right? At the same time, you know, some of these problems are difficult to solve. Some of them are very easy to solve. You know, we could do something in the language to, to make these things better. Um, the way that we think about it is that like these are things that make it interesting to think about a successful language, but they're not the most important problem, right? They're not what really puts makes us a priority for the ecosystem. And of course, that priority is what does that is correctness, safety, and security, right? So the way that we think about this is that a program's first priority is to be correct, and that programming languages can do a lot to support correctness. At the same time, we understand that programmer errors are inevitable, and we think that pro programming languages can 
or should not escalate those errors into security problems. Mm -hmm. And on those two vital points, we think that are, these four predecessor languages absolutely fail us. And they absolutely fail our ecosystem. So let me break those, those two points down. How can a programming language help support correctness? The first thing I want to say is that clarity of code is so mm. important for getting correctness. In okay. fact, I've heard it described itself as a security mitigation. If you can look at code, read code, understand what it's supposed to be doing, and you're not distracted from that by like all sorts of other stuff, that itself helps you write better code. And it helps eliminate bugs before they actually get out into the wild. Now, how do you get clarity <laughs> of code? One of the most important principles that we think is that important decisions made by the code should be explicit. Right? And in particular, it should take work to ignore things, especially things like dynamic sources of error or like values that you probably need to care about. Right? And you might think from the fact that I've just devoted a couple of bullets to the idea that things should be explicit, that we really want like a very explicit, verbose language in a lot of ways. But we actually don't. It's very important that we not be that we be a relatively compact language so that you can see the point of the code, right? Because explicitness itself, if you get to the point where it, like, it's drowning out the intent of the code, mm -hmm. that itself detracts from clarity. So how does a programming language help you avoid security problems? And of course, <laughs> uh, Sean's talk earlier this afternoon earlier this morning was great on this. Um, the way I want to talk about it is about protecting the abstract machine. We, a programming language runs theoretically in a kind of abstract machine. It has rules that keep it going forward, keep the program doing what it claims to be doing. And the most important thing about avoiding security problems is protecting that. That means that critical preconditions that are necessary for the machine to keep working like it's supposed to, like the program intent is for it to work. Those critical preconditions always need to be enforced. Like that statically, if possible. Obviously, if you can do it statically, that then there aren't any performance trade-offs. Uh, and you also get um, both clarity in the code itself as well as like, you know, like hopefully a much shorter debugging cycle, right? But if necessary, dynamically, right? Like it's like if we have to pay for it dynamically in order to get safety, we will do that. We will do that every single time. Final bit of philosophy here is that we believe it's always better to halt than to corrupt the virtual machine. Um, like uh, this is really about recovery. We don't really believe that recovery, for the most part, should, is like from this kind of basic correctness fault is something that is worth trying to pursue within a process. We think that is often very important for high availability things, but the way that you need to do that, especially because you have this possibility of corruption, you have this possibility of, you know, uh, like crashing the process anyway, you need to have something supervising your code, right? And if you're gonna have something supervising your code, you you know, like you might as well halt reliably and rely on your supervisor to actually do it properly. And this philosophy is, I, I should point out, it's, of course, it's really important for enabling correctness and, uh, and avoiding these security problems. It's also really helpful in the debugging cycle, right? Like this means that you are catching problems right up front, right, you know, um, and but, uh, and you're catching them when they happen, when the corrupt before the corruption happens, rather than trying to figure out, you know, like after something's trampled over God knows what memory, like uh, what actually went wrong. So let me talk. I'm not going to go through all of the problems that we see in C and C++ as basic correctness problems. Obviously, this topic has been a little bit done to death anyway. But I want to talk through a couple of these things specifically to indicate, to go through like the philosophy that of we see it of what's important and like how these things ought to be fixed. Um, 
and when when we're talking about fixes, it's an interesting. We see a, a very common pattern for trying to fix these things within the context of C and uh, within the context of C and C plus plus. So. <laughs> It's very common that, yes, there's absolutely something we can do about any particular issue to make it better, right? Like, we can add some sort of real mitigation. It will improve things, right? Often, that's only a partial fix. There are many aspects of the problem that it doesn't address. Like, it's addressing, you know, it in a particular context, but it's not addressing a different context. Or it's addressing, you know, some sources of the problem, but it's not addressing all of the sources of the problem. Often, also, when you're working with these sort of partial solutions, you get pretty uh, dramatic performance trade-offs, which really actually holds back how much you can deploy the fix. But the biggest problem is often these things don't really promote correctness in the code the way that we really want them to, right? They are patching over a bad language design rather than getting us to something where the code is more structurally correct in the first place. So let me work through one example of that, which is uninitialized memory. So the most embarrassing problem with uninitialized memory is obviously with local variables, right? So here's an example. We've got a then local variable if objects is false, if there aren't any objects returned here, uh, then is never going to get initialized. And then we're off in undefined behavior land when we actually try to use it. So there's been work to initialize local variables, obviously. Uh, we deploy that mode extensively at Apple. Um, JF worked on this quite a bit. Uh, this is great. It's, uh, it eliminates undefined, uh, um, important source of undefined behavior. It's very low cost. It represents real progress in the language. This kind of thing, absolutely worth doing. And JF has also proposed just guaranteeing zero initialization in C++. The only reason we haven't gone down that road so like with the first step is that uh, we felt that that would be treading on the grounds of the language committee. Uh, and, but if the language just does it, then absolutely do it, please. It's, it's great progress, right? Um, but it doesn't promote correctness, right? The, Real problem in this code is that like that that hand, that case is probably not being handled, right? We should think about the right thing to do in this case. Now, the th right thing to do in this case is probably to assign zero into the into this len variable, but um, you know, to promote that, that's really easy for a program to do, right? They can do that explicitly. Um, we should tell them that there's this problem in the language, and then they should go do it because it's three characters, right? Um, so great, let's, let's diagnose that. Let's force you to initialize thing, something, a local variable on every path before you, get to, before you use it. We can't do that in C or C++. That's a massive source break, right? We have to introduce some sort of dialect that like, does not work like normal C or C++. Right? There's not really a path here from the existing languages. So we can, you know, there's something we can do. It's mm -hmm. worth doing. It's a great mitigation. Solves some slice of the problem. Doesn't promote, promote correctness. I want to take work through another example. Uh, integer overflow. There's been a ton of discussion over the last few years about defining signed overflow in the language. And again, uh, signed overflow being undefined behavior this is embarrassing. It's a trivial source of undefined behavior. We should eliminate that. And the only reasonable way to eliminate that in C or C++ is to define it to wrap around. Okay. The problem with that idea, though, is that overflow is a logic error, right? Like it's not really correct. You shouldn't wrap around. Like that's that's a problem. Your language shouldn't continue. Your code, your program shouldn't continue. There are narrow circumstances where that's appropriate. But if you want to do that, you should opt into it, right? It's mm -hmm. you know that you're writing a hash function and that you want this addition to wrap around. You're probably thinking about it while you're writing the hash function, mm -hmm. right? Uh, certainly, if you're writing a generic hash combination routine, you know that you're, you're thinking about it. It's really easy to use a routine, like a, spe a different operator or a special function that adds things and guarantees wraparound, right? The default should be 
that wrapper that overflow traps or something like that. That's our perspective. Um, so wrapping, much better than undefined behavior, still not the right default. There is not any reasonable path to make all integer types overflow in C and C++. I mean, wrap, trap on overflow in C and C++. We could introduce new types that do this, right? Uh, certainly, you can opt into it. You can put yourself forcibly into a dialect. There's actually quite a bit of code at Apple that deploys it's C and C++ code, and it deploys in production with UB sand turned on and with flags saying, make, you know, like uh, also trap on unsigned wraparound, which is, of course, not, you know, allowed in the language. But like, put yourself in a dialect. We do it. You know, it's important. It's worth doing, right? But no path to do it, fixing this in C or C++. Last thing I want to talk about is bounce checks. So the standard containers, Standard container types in C++ right, don't do bounce checks. The some libraries do have debug iterators. A quick show of hands, how many people in here even know how to turn on the debug iterator feature in the night? Great. That's pretty good. How many of you ship it in, in production? <laughs> how about assertions? <laughs> yeah, so we actually do ship this in production in, in some environments, not all of them. Uh, Lib C++ has a debug iterator feature, and we there are sit places in our stack where we turn that on like that. Are, yeah, go ahead. So uh, I, I, I used to give this, I've given the security talk for 20 years and mm -hmm. uh, I had some guys from Microsoft show up and I was saying, you know, hey, you should have debug iterators. And, you know, and the Microsoft guys came to me and said, you know what, we do that. We have it turned on. Mm -hmm. uh, so I said, oh, that's great. So then a few years later, uh, Herb Sutter called me and he goes, uh, so we have this problem, okay? The, the, the libraries, um, you know, they're saying, hey, our guys are really smart and make these kind of stupid errors. So they're not, and they're saying, right. you know, we're getting 30% overhead, 300% in some cases, so we're turning off. Right. And then by default, the application's had it on. Right. So now you get weird kind of link time errors. Yeah. And so we said, well, we're gonna add some flags. And I said, great, then you can leave it on. Yeah, it's and a whole I, ecosystem sort of problem, like yeah, enabling yeah, yeah. these things. Yeah. yeah. So that's, that's, yeah. Right. The places we turn this on in Apple's stack are definitely isolated places. And that's one of the reasons why. That's one of the major reasons why. It's like uh, isolated places where that are particularly uh, security uh, conscious. Yes. Yeah. Like they're particularly important for security um, and where we know that the bounds of that are like that. You know, the like, ABI like, mismatch like, problems like are kernel, constrained right? to a particular place. I, I don't I can't get into the details of where we deploy this. But like uh, but yeah, it, it's a really expensive feature and it's really problematic to deploy, right? Like um, you know, there's a lot of overhead here that uh, that's that's hard to eliminate. And I actually want to dig into uh, why it's hard to eliminate that. Um, you know, this isn't. This is going to be a little bit about compiler optimization and debug iterators and balance checks, but it's not really, right? But this really is is a point about pointers, right? It's a point about pointers and <laughs> local reasoning. So this function, very idiomatic. You've probably written this a million times because for some reasons uh, there is no default streaming thing that just does uh, a collection. Uh, you know. So yeah, that's common. Are there's there now? Oh, that's great. Uh, <laughs> I still write it a million times. Sorry. Um, right. So there's a you know this is very idiomatic. We're taking in a collection by const reference, uh, and we're streaming out all of the things one at a time. You know, using the nice range for loop. Uh, the range for loop, as we all know, expands to something like this. So we've got this dereference in the loop. If we want to talk about adding bounce checks to this code, obviously what we need to happen is we need this dereference here to do a bounce check. It needs to specifically <laughs> compare the internal state of i against the current value of c and make sure that those bounds are actually, that, that the iterator is actually in bounds for the particular container. Um, now, 
I can change over the course of this loop. You're gonna to have to take my word for this as a compiler engineer. This analysis is actually super simple. It's not sim simple, it's actually hard, but compilers are, have to be very good at it in order to compile C very well, and so they are. So this is actually really straightforward for a compiler to do. They can absolutely uh, do this. All they have to do is prove that C doesn't change during this loop. Right, and we know that C doesn't change to this loop, right? It's a const reference. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, a reference is pretty much just a pointer. And pointers <clears throat> can point to anything, and anything else can point to it at the same time. Uh, and const doesn't really mean anything. It means this function can't change it, like, without doing something like a const cast, <laughs> right? Uh, it certainly doesn't mean that no other code can change it out from under us. So it doesn't tell us anything, right? And that means that we can't reason about C locally, right? We have to ask in the optimizer whether anything could possibly change C. And the answer to that has to be yes in almost every situation. Like by default, it's going to be yes. Uh, in particular, it has to be yes whenever we see something like a synchronous function call that we don't understand anything about. So unless the comp compiler here knows an awful lot of special stuff about the OStream streaming operators, these operator calls are going to completely block this analysis, and we can't remove the bounce checks. The stream itself is hookable, even if the compiler knew about the other stream. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, like, right. Like, you know, even if we could, you know, inline the first thing, there's going to be some sort of manipulation that goes down virtual, and we're just right. out of luck. Right? Like I said, this isn't really about compiler optimization. It's about pointers and how pointers undermine local reasoning. Local reasoning, as a general principle, is incredibly important. Um, first, it's important for the clarity of code. As a programmer, if you can't reason locally about your code and the data it's working with and how that data changes through the function and so on, it is just so much harder to understand what is what is doing and whether you're doing it right. Um, second, local reasoning is at the center of almost everything that we know about how to make languages like this reliably safe. Almost every feature that we have for better and stronger safety checks really strongly benefits from local reasoning. And if we can't reason as something about as if we can't reason about something as humans with all the extra knowledge that we have, like the compiler really doesn't have a chance. And that means those features are not feasible. And unfortunately pointers and, and C references simply do not carry enough information to support local reasoning like this. You always have to do a holistic global analysis and try to get everything into one function so you can do everything at once. In order to fix that, we need to make pointers follow stricter rules. And we've got to have more than one kind of pointer in the language, frankly, because we need different kinds of strictness in different contexts. Maybe we need ownership. Maybe we need aliasing restrictions. Maybe we need constness. Uh, and a lot of common idioms, including most standard uses of iterators, especially in C++, really defeat this. And they're very difficult to prove safety for. So when we're talking about fixing these things, we're talking about making a lot of changes at once. Um, I forgot to pitch this again. So we have all these problems, right? The problems that I talked through and the problems I'm going to list before. Can we fix these things without a new language? Well, there's three main hurdles to that. The first thing is that it's still a really big project. If you're talking about changing C++ to have all these things in it, you're like, that's great. We can imagine that this is just magically happens in the language. Adopting this stuff in your code is going to be an explicit step. That means a lot of your code has to change. And that code will have interoperation problems with the code that hasn't changed. So you either change everything all at once, hugely problematic, or you've got these interoperation problems, and which is also problematic. The second thing is that a lot of these changes are really difficult to do. 
Anything that changes behavior without changing source, something like making you know integer arithmetic trap on overflow by default, is incredibly problematic to do in a programming language because all the existing code, you don't know what of it is actually relying on that and what isn't, right? And it's very difficult to track that down without actually just like flipping a switch and comprehensively debugging every single problem that you run into. That's really, really hard to do. And it's really, really hard for a program, programming language com community to decide that it is going to force on everybody in, in the programming language. Furthermore, programmers will need to do things like introduce new types in new places. And that means changing the signatures of functions. And that means, you know, all of a sudden you might have multiple clients to that function. And they need to use it with different signatures because you've got this interoperation problem. And that becomes really, really tough when you're talking about changing code in place. This kind of pervasive migration is much easier to do when you can kind of try to make as hard of a barrier as possible between your old code and the new code. Finally, source compatibility is a huge problem. <coughs> Changing the default rules makes it much harder to move forward incrementally. Uh, and that can make it impossible to move forward at all. But not changing the default rules means that we've got unsafe behavior by default, pervasively throughout the language. Everywhere we've got that old behavior, we're going to have to remember to override it. And that just amplifies all the other problems that we've been talking about, about the magnitude of changes that are required, while still leaving you with this kind of unclear, hard to understand code in your programming language. <sighs> I need to remember how to use slides. So let's imagine we did fix all this, and we made a new version of C or C++ that addressed all these safety problems. Migrating all of our code forward to that new version of C and C++ is a huge project with a lot of rewriting and with serious questions about how to interoperate with the old language versions as we go along. Okay, Those problems are basically the problems of introducing a new programming language anyway. Right? Those are language interoperation problems. The new version is effectively a new language. Except we're still stuck with the old language, right? All of the old defaults are wrong, right? And we're, we're stuck with it, right? We've got all these awkward compromises on performance and safety because we weren't able to fix all the problems properly, right? So we're doing all the work of adopting a new language. We're getting far fewer of the benefits. And that doesn't really make any sense. Now, like I said, these changes that we can do, to, that we can do to C and C++, they're absolutely worth doing. We've got a ton of code, and we will indefinitely for the indefinite future in C and C++, right? But we can, so we can make these changes, but we should understand those changes as what they are. Incremental improvements and mitigations to help with those billions of lines of code that are still out there. Meanwhile, we feel very strongly that we have to move forward with a language that gets these rules right. And hey, if we're going to do that anyway, we might as well fix function pointer syntax. <laughs> So we feel pretty strongly that, uh, you know, obviously at Apple, uh, our successor language is Swift. And I want to talk through the features of Swift, both to try to sell you on Swift, but also to talk about, you know, the things that we think are really necessary and the ways in which a programming language can support, <coughs> you know, clearer code, safer, and more correct code. Like I said before, Apple has always intended Swift to be a successful language for all of our predecessor languages. From the top to the bottom of our stack, uh, accessible to novices, powerful enough for experts. It's a really tall order. I don't want to go too deep into the language tutorial here, but let me talk through some of these basic features. I'm going to start really simple with local variables. Uh, in Swift, a let is a truly immutable binding within its scope. A var can be reassigned, but only locally. You can pass it by reference to something, but when you pass it by reference, it can only be changed within that function, and that can't escape. What that means is that when you do pass it by reference that way, you can think of that function call as changing it, uh, from, which means from, that, from the caller's perspective, you can actually think about all the changes to that variable as, you know, in a, as happening locally, right? So you actually maintain perfect local reasoning ability about 
every local variable, both as programmers, of course, but also in the compiler, which will enable a lot of other things in the future. And of course, we also require variables to be initialized before use. So you can see here uh, where you've got a diagnostic if we use Y before it's been initialized. Uh, let me talk about the types somewhat. Structs in Swift use a concept of value semantics that C++ programmers should find very familiar. Uh, this simple temperature struct just wraps a double, so it behaves like a double. If I copy it and modify the original variable, that assignment doesn't change the copy. So you can still reason locally about these aggregate values, not just the sort of primitive values of ints and doubles. I want to add a couple initializers to this for a couple of reasons. First, uh, <coughs> Swift uses the same initialization rule for stored properties as it does for locals. So before this initializer returns, you have to have initialized everything in it. Otherwise, we don't care what order you do it in. It's just normal code that executes during the course of this, of this function. But you know, if you don't initialize all the stored properties before the initializer returns, it's a hard error. You can also see here that I've got a couple different initializers that are distinguished by the names of the parameters. <coughs> Parameter names in Swift are significant by default. They serve as argument labels. And argument labels are another great tool for promoting correctness. They make code more readable. They make it more understandable. You can just see at a glance what's going on. It also solves some kind of annoying problems with initializers especially, because you can't otherwise name initializers. Uh, Swift allows you to add new members to types from anywhere with an extension. That's not a safety feature. It's just great. Uh, let's add a method to it. Uh, methods on structs uh, are non-mutating by default, which means we can't modify self within this method, just like uh, if it were const. But it's more than that, because Swift has a rule called exclusivity, which doesn't just guarantee that you can't uh, modify it, but that nobody can modify it, only this variable only this function, uh, well, for non-mutating thing, multiple things can have a reference to it at the same time, but uh, none of them can be mutating it. So when you've got a non-mutating reference to something, nobody else can possibly mutate it at the same time. So that means we get local analysis for this, uh, for self, this in C++ terms. Uh, uh, let's instead add a mutating method. Now, of course, in this method, we can modify self, but exclusivity still kicks in and says that only this method can change self. And moreover, nobody else has a reference to it. So only this, ver this method can access self while, the while it's running. So we also have a guarantee that uh, nobody is going to sneak around and observe the things that we do in this function. And that gives us total isolation in this this uh, you know isolation of self within this <coughs> function and uh, gives us again the ability to locally reason about the value. Now temperature of course was a really simple type and those were pretty simple methods. Swift's collections are also structs. So first off they have value semantics. Uh, we can create a, an array. If we copy that array we are copying the value semantically. If we then modify the original array that change is not reflected in the copy that we made. But not only do they have value semantics, they also have exclusivity because they're just structs. So here's a simple example where we're looping over an array and calling a function that was passed in. If this were C++, it would have a subtle implicit assumption that the callback doesn't somehow modify the collection during the execution of this. If it did, the iteration that we're doing over the collection that we're calling this on could go completely here, right? We're off an undefined behavior. We've invalidated it. In Swift, that's not possible. We know that the language will not allow self to change during this method. So you can reason about it totally statically, totally locally, uh, just like as if it were a local variable. Excuse me, can I change your battery back? Yeah. That's my strong died on the recording. <clears throat> Any questions? Yeah. So, how does Swift prevent that somebody takes mutable references and stashes it somewhere else? So that is a broader, so you know, just broadly, the language 
doesn't let you do that. So when you form a mutable reference to something, it has, there's an escape analysis done. Mm -hmm. So you just can't okay. escape it. Thank you. All right. Good. Mm -hmm. And that, of course, is a totally local rule, right? Yeah. So it doesn't have any overhead associated with it. It's just static being enforced, static being enforced all the time. So when you like, have a function that, a method on something that takes a mutable reference, you can't store that mutable reference in safe right. somewhere. And, like that kind of place can never. Okay. You know, we do have, of course, unsafe pointers yeah. and you capture those things, right? And, you know, there's, there is an unsafe feature where you can form an unsafe pointer in a scoped way mm -hmm. to a local variable. And if you, of course, you, if you escape that, you know, you're yeah. kind of off the line. But that is an explicitly unsafe feature. Right. Uh, the last thing I want to mention is, uh, so of course, we know that the language won't allow itself to change. And for what it's worth, that also, of course, makes it easier to eliminate bounce checks. So this method could absolutely, provably not have any to do any bounce checking no overhead to the bounce checking feature at all because we know that we're just iterating you know from the start to end of a collection that can never change. I'm going to say two other quick things. First, this is a generic function. Uh, generics are really easy to write in Swift. Everything in this function is type checked up front as generic code. Uh, that's great for usability of course because you always get errors in your generic code up front. You don't have to you know uh, potentially deal with the fact that it, it it fails to instantiate only for a particular set of type arguments. Um, it also helps promote correctness because what happens during instantiation becomes extremely predictable, right? There's no, in C++, late binding of name resolution within a template means that sometimes templates find things that aren't what you expect, right? That's not possible in Swift. You decide what it results to up front in, in the generic code, and then, you know, which possibly is something dependent on the types involved, right? But it's dependent on it in a very explicit, well defined way, and it will always resolve to that associated thing for the particular type of organ I mean, we have another show. <laughs> well, it, it, the frequency must have changed in the no. pocket. All right. Well, I can pick up my pocket. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry about this. Any other questions? Get a const microphone. <laughs> since you're, uh, since we're taking, since we're in a break, could you could you elaborate on what you mean by successor language? Given uh, we we talked about that a little bit this morning, but yeah, um, you know, uh, we, we at Apple we don't see the old code. I mean, we, we see a need to replace that old code. And what I'm going to talk about in the next section is that that, of course, has to be learned. Right. Um, maybe we're um, that, uh, that has to be incremental. So it has to, uh, you know, like there's not going to be any massive rewrites of, you know, the entire system over this maybe on a project by project basis, but even then it's going to be part of the project, part of the project, you know, you're hitting high priority targets and that sort of kind of thing, right? Um, so we do see this as ultimately we want code to be, you know, like as much code as possible to be used in the successor language. That's what people be using Swift, right? Um, rather than any of the other languages. Uh, so in that sense, in, in the way you were talking about in your talk, it's a replacement language. Right? But we also, like, you know, there's just so much code, right? Um, so like, if you are very still committed to maintaining and improving things and for the existing languages. Once we get to the this is working. It's this end now. Okay. Can I go forward? Or yeah, I... you can go forward. Okay. I'll just speak a little louder if you can. All right. Can do that. Uh, the other super trivial thing, uh, this is what a function type is. So, <laughs> you know, uh, it looks like a function um, without the name, which is what a function type should look like. So. <laughs> super easy to learn. All right. 
Uh, Swift also provides enums as a second kind of value type with value semantics. Swift's enums are type safe. You can't just cast arbitrary integers into them. Mm -hmm. Uh, we know any value of this type is always going to be one of these three cases. So that alone, super powerful. We can also add payloads to cases, making the enum into an algebra of data types. This is a sum type. You, you know, one of these cases can store a temperature value. So we also get a kind of type safe union. And that, having that built into the language makes it a lot easier to maintain strong invariance in your code. Again, supporting correctness overall. To break down an enum, you can switch over. To promote correctness, these switches are required to be exhausted. You have to explicitly handle every case in the enum. You doesn't just like that your dash w switch built into the language. Uh, here I'm handling them one by one. You can of course have a default case if that's the right way of writing the code, but you have to do that explicitly. That is your choice to ignore the possible like gloss, gloss over all the other cases. <coughs> The same. Like several other languages, Swift draws a firm line between structs, which have value semantics and are always allocated in line, and classes, which have reference semantics and support subclasses. Class objects are always automatically managed by the language. If you've got a class reference, it's guaranteed to stay valid as long as you're using it. So you, there's no really any escape from this like you can with like, you know, getting something out of a unique pointer, right? Um, or using operator arrow on a shared pointer, which you have to do in order to use a shared pointer correctly. Uh, we do that with a very simple reference counting scheme. It uh, does mean it has the possibility of cycles, um, but it has predictable overheads and it doesn't require a large invasive runtime. More importantly, all the, that kind of overhead associated with this, it's restricted to class reference types. It's not, doesn't hit every type in the language. Since you can have multiple references to a class object, it's possible to violate the exclusivity rule that we were talking about with the stored, mutable stored properties of the, uh, of the class. You can have multiple things, they can use it at the same time, there's no way the compiler can set up three types. Exclusivity is a critical safety property of Swift. And so, if we can't enforce it statically, we enforce it dynamically. So yes, we do a dynamic check to make sure that you are not using, you know, you don't have multiple references to the same class property in different contexts at the same time. But again, it's specific to class properties and it's done in a very local way, which can be optimized in some situations. So you don't have to mark it mutating here, even though it's mutating? Uh, classes don't, we, we don't maintain the illusion that there's any meaningful difference for that for, with reference types, right? So with reference types, we just, there's no distinction between mutating and not mutating. Right? So, um, you can also escape um, the class, you can ex escape self in this method. Right? You know, there, there, it is, you know, when you get these classes, you are basically escaping back into a very traditional OO world where you, know, you have shared mutable references and so on, and we just impose as many checks as we can dynamically in order to make sure that that code is safe. But you are very much in that world. Let me screw this up again. Uh, I mentioned before that Swift has enum types. The most important enum type is optional, which represents that a value can be missing. Now optional can be used with any type. You can have an optional int, but I want to bring special attention to the fact that it can be used with class types. That's because class types can't be null. Uh, if you want to have a null, nullable class reference, you have to explicitly have an optional class reference. And whenever you work with an optional value, you have to handle the null possibility explicitly. The code won't just implicitly fail if the value is there. So this is basically solving all the problems in the world with null pointers at the same time. Very straightforward little language. We, have a, we throw a lot of syntax sugar at this in Swift in order to make working with this convenient. Uh, and that's actually a really important part of the design that like, look, you know, uh, we see that there's a balance to be done between, you know, having stricter language features that force you, try to force you to do the right thing and making it convenient to work with those, those features in a way that like makes people not end up doing the wrong thing all the time.
that, so that comes back to our general philosophy of promoting correctness by encouraging programmers to explicitly deal with things. And another dimension of that is with dynamic error handling. So Swift has exceptions. Um, we, don't, we tend to call them errors instead of exceptions, but really they're exceptions. But by default, functions are assumed to not throw. This is another example of getting the defaults right and making it possible to reason locally about behavior. If you have a function that wants to throw, it has to opt into it explicitly. And when you call something that can throw, we have to do something to explicitly handle it. Uh, we could have a whole catch here. Uh, in this case, we just want to propagate the uh, exception outwards, which we can do in a very syntactically light way, way with the try cube. But you have to mark explicitly that you want it to do this. Again, this promotes correctness by making it easier for programmers to local, locally reason about the control flow of the function, and by ma making sure that they understand and acknowledge all the places where failure is possible within their function. The last thing I want to talk about here is concurrency. Uh, Swift has a built-in high quality support for asynchronous programming with async await, superseding a lot of callback-based programming. So obviously that's a fairly significant usability and uh, just compactness, clarity of code benefit. It also preserves local code structure. Right? When you have callbacks, it's broken up into different functions, and you can't really reason about like what's happening in what function and you know what the relationship between those two things is. You maybe can do it as a programmer, the compiler really doesn't have a shelf. Because everything here is constrained to a particular local context and it's maintained as a local context uh, on, on every semantic sense through the, throughout the optimizer. Uh, that means that language rules based around local reasoning still work with asynchronous functions, right? If you do something like coroutines, all of those rules about, you know, as a general feature with a general rewrite that breaks everything up into functions, like very early in, in, the, in the process, all of these rules go out the window. Like every, all of your local features, they're not really local. Swift concurrency also enforces data isolation. That means we warn, uh, which is a short-term thing, eventually it will be an error, on attempts to share values between threads when those values aren't thread safe. Like when you have references to something like um, pass with mutable store, mutable shared, mutable stored properties. Uh, again, this is a major improvement to the safe, this overall data isolation that we do is a major improvement to the safety and correctness of concurrent code. And in particular, it relies on analysis that we could never have done reliably, never have added reliably in any way to in our pre predecessor languages, because it's local. All right, so we've got all this C and C++ code. And let's say we do want to start moving this way. How do we actually get there? The way we see it, there's really three key ideas that you need to keep in mind when you're doing this kind of migration to a successful language. The first is to be incremental. Huge rewrites are just incredibly treacherous. Um, as software developers, excuse me, you can take your Latin more, please. Oh. Sorry. You can actually leave the microphone, we just need the back. Oh, okay. uh, no, I need the whole thing, actually, yeah. We have the microphone right here, Mark. Thank you very much. We're getting you with that, Nick. Okay, thank you. All right, I'll just talk about it. Uh, as software engineers, we usually can't just stop shipping software, right? You can't do that for years at a time, so that means you have to maintain the old code. If you're doing a huge rewrite, that means you have to maintain the old version alongside the new. That's a lot of duplicated work, and it creates divisions within your team, which I'll talk about a little bit more in a second. There's also, and this is probably e an even more dangerous part of this, a very natural tendency when you're doing this kind of large-scale rewrite to try to simultaneously fix everything in the system, <laughs> right? Uh, this kind of second system effect when you're doing this kind of rewrite is really problematic, but it's also when like it scales really, really badly with 
the size of the rewrite that you're doing. Um, when you're doing a large scale rewrite like this, uh, the system is often in a state where it's not expected to work in past tests, right? Because all the code is changing. It's all broken, right? And that means you end up with a bunch of code that doesn't work, right? And then you have no ability to test until everything comes together. And then all of a sudden you're debugging the entire system at once, right? So you do this kind of thing across multiple systems at once and you get this combinatorial explosion of risk, right? The problems have you're happening like each of these subsystems you know is in a total state of i don't know what's going on with it they're all in that state all of their interactions are in that state um you start you end up in a you get a project that ends up in this kind of world and uh management starts seeing how long this is taking and you've got this existing code base that works and that you're maintaining and that you're adding all of your new features to while simultaneously making them to this pile of code that doesn't work. And management is going to look at this and be like, what are you people doing? Right? Is this ever actually going to come to that? Is this like, should we just copy? Right? And they're probably right. Like a lot of projects like this do never succeed. Right? You get into this state and the way that you succeed is you start it and you do it right. And the way that you do it right is you have to be incremental, right? You need to keep everything working and passing tests. And your talk was great about this. Uh, any rewritten code needs to just become another part of a cohesive function <coughs> system, right? So, so you're still, still going to have some uh, second system, system effects. So that's, you know, when you're doing this kind of view, right? you're changing it to a new language. You can't necessarily eliminate all of that. And it's, that's, that's okay, right? The important thing is that like that kind of stuff, you're, it's basically a factor that you're doing to one piece of the code, right? Great. Thank you very much. Right. So it's a refactor that you're doing to a piece of the code, right? Which means that uh, it's incremental and you can apply it incrementally to your code base and test that it works in isolation as one particular piece of change. And then you've got a cohesive functioning system again, right? So like, the second system impact, hugely mitigated just by doing some things incrementally in the first place. And you get the benefits, presumably, of the second system things, because usually those are good changes to make, right? You just don't want to do them all at once. The second important principle here is that you need to keep moving forward. Um, the most important thing there is that you want to try to write any new code in the new language. Now, sometimes there is going to be a good reason that you can't do that, and that's okay, right? But you should keep track of those blockers and try to understand them and understand what work is going to unblock them. And then you can prioritize that work and make sure that like that happens so that when you come back again to write new code that's of a similar kind, you won't be blocked, right? You keep moving forward across your entire project. Finally, I want to talk a little bit about team psychology because this is actually really important. Um, it's very common that not everybody is going to be on board at once with the idea of adopting a new programming language, right? Um, they might not understand why it's important. They might disagree with the priorities. They might disagree with the language that you've chosen. Uh, or, you know, it might just be more basic things. They might be afraid that their skills are going to be obsolete if they move to the new language. Or they might just be worried, right? Uh, that's all understandable. It's okay. It's acceptable. It's fine. Like, you need to handle that and, like, make it part of your plans, right? Being incremental here actually is a huge part of that. Like, uh, of how you handle this well, right? Because what you see when you make incremental progress is, first off, you don't get these artificial boundaries between the people who are rewriting things into the new code and like the people who are stuck maintaining the old code, which is an incredibly toxic place for a team to end up, right? Um, but also, you're making these incremental changes, and it's landing, and it's working, right? It's in the code. The people can see that it's not a disaster. 
everybody's working on it. They can get in and like do things on their own time. Uh, you know, like which is also really important that like people have the opportunity to you know start like coming to terms with the fact that you're doing this and that it's going to be okay, right? Um, you start seeing this. You start seeing that like it works. Like it is making things better. They can learn the new language, right? They can learn just enough to make one or two line changes at first, but they'll, they'll understand it. They'll understand how it fits in. They'll understand in the context of like how it fits in with the old code, which means it makes much easier to approach. Uh, and all of a sudden people start getting them on board, right? Like the psychological barriers that people build up in their minds to like, this is gonna be a disaster, it's not gonna work. And this is a boondoggle that we shouldn't bother to do, right? They start coming down. So how do we enable that kind of incremental adoption? Um, a lot of this is about good language design, again, frankly. Uh, a successor language needs to support tight interoperation with the predecessor <coughs> language uh, so that you can build very smart, migrate very small parts of the system at once on really a file by file basis, right? Or as small scale as you possibly can, right? Um, that means that the successor language needs to fit into your build system. It needs to generate ordinary object files that can just be linked in, right? Without a whole lot of other fuss. It needs to be able to use interfaces offered by your predecessor language. It needs to be able to offer its interfaces to predecessor languages. We've been doing this for a pretty long time with C and Objective-C. It's been a roaring success, right? We've done, like, uh, we've, like, I think most code out there is migrating towards Swift away and away from Objective-C. It's been, you know, uh, we're very happy with, with the rate of progress here. Um, so the way that we do this, obviously, we fit into build systems. We can read C and Objective-C headers into Swift, and we can export Swift declarations back to obje Objective-C by generating a header that describes uh, the Swift interfaces. Yeah? So, so your use of the word import and export here suggests you do this once, and then if the interfaces evolve, then... No, 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 sorry. It's, there's no, it's not fundamentally about code generation. It's very live, right? So obviously, to generate a header, we, you, know, that, you have to have a build step that does that. But you can do that build step from your live code. You don't do it once, build an FFI you know, layer that lives forever in your project, right? You know, and on the other side, like Swift directly imports your C and C, your C Objective C, C plus plus headers, right? Um, it doesn't need to like, again, map produce bindings that work in in Swift. It does that directly from the from the C declarations. Yeah. Just to expand on that. Do you do you model the full preprocessor expansion and preprocessor state in that header import import step, or using like Clang modules? Uh, like yeah, we use Clang modules. We, we, okay. we like Clang is linked into the Swift compiler. Right. We directly, you know, we just have some code that basically walks AST and says, "What should this look like in Swift?" Clang modules. All right, so let me work through some quick examples of what this looks like in C. So here's a bit of the POSIX API, and here's the completely literal translation of that in Swift. Right? Exactly what like what you'd expect. Everything works exactly like you. It says it does, like these are functions, you can call them. Um, the compiler understands at the implementation level that these functions were imported from Swift and so that when it calls them, it has to use the C calling conventions. If you take the address and use it in a high order way, it has to wrap it in a Swift convention function uh, and not just call it directly. Yeah. Does it break your C safety guarantees? I'll get to that. <laughs> yeah. So I see why those have to be like uh, unsafe, mutable raw pointers and, and whatnot. But it seems like uh, if you're if you're doing a lot of interop pervasively, that might tend to erode the uh, uh, unsafe. Might stop being alarming and stop, might stop being something that people pay extra attention to. Yeah, I mean that's certainly a risk. I think we the way that we see it is that like um, like sometimes when you have fun like. It's when you have APIs like this that are that are using API, I mean that, I mean, read 
you know, the na the a much better way of doing well. All of these POSIX functions, right? They should throw, right? Like, why, why do they return an, a, a status code instead of throwing, right? And like a uh, uh, pipe, you know, like it returns <coughs> two file descriptors. That's what it's it takes this unsafe mutable pointer, right? Like, you know, so you can do a better job. Right, and you should, and we have a library, of course, for POSIX that like that wraps this, right? But like you know, this is just an API that everybody should be familiar with. You get this very literal translation. Okay, yeah. Um, if I don't know if Swift has flexible array members, but if it doesn't, and there just does not exist a translation to the target language, how would you maintain? Uh, like the ability to FFI and the things that you don't want to add to your language. Like if you decided I don't want flexible array members in Swift, yeah. how would you call a C function that um, where that interface? So generally, if we can't array. import, if we decide that we can't import a type at all into Swift, right, because it's got features that we don't know about, we just import it as essentially as if, you know, like if you have a pointer to that, if you have like a, something returning that by value, then like we just can't import that function, of course. If you have something that's taking or um, returning pointers to it, we'll treat it like a void star. Yeah. I know this is a bit of a nitpicking, but uh, POSIX defines find the script as says int, but now you say int 32, so. The int type in Swift is, uh, um, more like uh, size t, mm -hmm. right? It's the size. It's the size of a word processor. Yeah, word. but for, for the general FFI thing, so uh, oh yeah. So there's if a I'm mapping. on a platform where int is a different size, then the POSIX API on that platform will want a different size. So can I ask somehow? You know. Yeah. So we are incredibly concerned about supporting 16-bit platforms. <laughs> uh, I don't. I don't. I don't think we. Um, particularly care about any platforms where, int, I guess int is allowed to be 16-bit, even on a 32-bit platform, but like uh, that's a very rare configuration. Um, we, uh, yeah, we did. Well, you're gonna ignore think... ILP64 like everyone else. Um, no, we support. Well, because if the si if size of int was 64 bits. Yeah, we have then... a Windows, oh, like ILP. Yeah. Uh, no one does that. Anymore. So if you import, if you were on this platform, on a platform like that, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Let me let me okay. back up. Like the map, the way that this stuff maps, right, is that the standard library provides some type, some type aliases that like tells us how what type to use as you know what type in the standard library to use for the C int type. So there's a type alias called C int in the standard library, like. I am providing the common case here where, where that maps over to int32. You could absolutely have a standard library where that maps to int16 or to int64. And on a you know, non-common thing, like on a platform like that, these functions would not have that type. That would be non-portability in, you know, uh, in what is basically a non-portable API, right? Um, so like otherwise, you get these things that you know, feel fairly natural. If you wanted to have a more portable API and that was very uh, natural around Swift, of course, like a native feeling Swift API, when you introduced uh, some sort of like, you know, all the, the wrapper functions that throw and so on, you would also presumably want to have a file descriptor type that wraps your like n 32 You wouldn't actually pass it around as n 32 all right, and actually, we our importer has the ability to recognize type defs and turn them into strong type defs in that way. Um, you know, uh, you would need to actually use the strong top type def, which the POSIX API doesn't. But um, but if you do use it, you can mark that thing as being imported uh, strongly in Swift. Um, okay, uh, the translation does not have to be so literal. So this is a bit of code from Apple's core graphics platform API. Uh, this is using a very common idiom in C where we have basically got a reference type, right? Where we've got an opaque, uh, we've got a type def that is an opaque pointer 
Uh, we always use that type def, or we always pass it around using as a, an opaque pointer. We're never using it as a value and so on. Um, you can use annotations either directly in the source code or out of line using a special fo file format that we've got. Uh, you can use annotations to tell Swift to import this in a more natural way. So uh, in fact, Core Graphics does this and you get this. Uh, the rules here that we've got like this reference type, it happens to be reference countable, um, which I didn't show, but like it, trust me, it is. Uh, so it is basically a class, right? And all of those functions that we had, right? These these are methods, right? So they're methods, right? Much more idiomatic API, very straightforward to do. Interoperation with C++ is something that we've been working on in the last year. And it's already in a pretty usable state, although there's a lot of progress that still is left to be done. Um, has the basic same Base, same basic design as C and Objective-C. So we import headers into Swift and directly interpret them as Swift declarations. And similarly, we can export headers that expose those declarations, those Swift declarations back to C++. First things first though, Swift has to fit into your build system. And of course, you can always just do this by adding custom build rules, but Swift is actually directly supported by CMake now. So you can just add CMake files to your build system and it works and it will get linked in. Um, all right, so let me talk about the two directions of interoperation. Exposing C Swift declarations to C++ by generating, we generate a header, right? This is very straightforward, um, but it's actually pretty neat because uh, when we generate C and Objective-C uh, declaration headers, we have to worry about matching the C and Objective-C conventions in the APIs that we uh, generate. So Objective-C, we have to generate some sort of Objective-C class. Uh, we have to add methods to it that requires code generation when we are compiling the Swift code. Uh, similar for C. C++ headers are extremely expressive. You can write tons of code that all goes inline. It's all magically in the header. It's, everything is wonderful. Um, what that means is that we can actually generate header declarations that directly use the Swift ABI, which is very weird. So it, uh, if you look at these headers, they're incredibly gross and they've got like all sorts of inline asm and funky attributes on it. But the result is something extremely idiomatic looking. So we worked through this example of a temperature struct with some uh, property and an initializer on it. When we export this to C++, it comes in as this very idiomatic C++ class. This class has all of the proper rule of five operations for the Swift type. Even if it's storing, like obviously temperature is a trivial type, but if this type stored non-trivial types or was even did not have a static size, which is something that can happen in the Swift ABI, um, it would still work. Like this type, it's just there. It, all of the code is inline. It's directly using the C the Swift ABI. Because it's directly using the Swift ABI, actually we can do this retroactively. So uh, I said that Objective-C, to expose this sort of stuff, we have to compile code into the Swift module. When we do this for C++, we can just take an existing Swift module and say, hey, uh, give me a C++ interface for it. And bam, like everything that's public, everything that's a part of the public interface of that module shows up in an idiomatic way in C++, in, in C++. Going the other way around works by interpreting C++ declarations into Swift one. And here we have some unique challenges because of C++. C interfaces are very simple and it's pretty obvious how to import them. Uh, Objective-C is less simple, but it has some very strong idioms. C++ is uh, incredibly complicated and doesn't have any consistent idioms across the entire ecosystem yet. Uh, do you support inheritance across language boundaries? Uh, sorry, I missed that word. Do you support Compar plus inheritance? Oh, inheritance. Uh, no, we don't. That's a feature that we're thinking about how to do, but we don't currently have the ability to. Um, I don't think there's really any ability for us. We would need C plus 
plus compiler changes to allow Swift classes to be overridden from like derived from from C++. The other way is feasible, but we have we don't currently support it. Um, I think it's it's on the list, but there's probably higher priority things to do. Uh, right, so C, different code bases in C++ use very different idioms. It's not always clear to do. The safety story is also more complicated. C++ interfaces tend to make a lot of assumptions about object lifetime and destructors. We don't want things like that to un ultimately undermine the safety properties that we want for Swift. Mm -hmm. So what we do is we make reasonable default assumptions about C++ APIs. So reference parameters, we assume that if they're declared const, that they will actually honor that. If we also assume that the function isn't going to just escape a reference argument, right? Uh, reference return values, we assume that those depend on their lifetime on one of the arguments. Uh, if it's a method, we're going to assume that it depends on this. Uh, similar rules apply to view types like std span. Um, those are defaults. So uh, we will have the ability to override those defaults with attributes um, so that you can say, hey, look, I need you to import this. Uh, either don't import this thing. It's just an unsafe API. I need to wrap it in some other way. Or import it with uh, like using unsafe pointers or something like that, and I'll take care of it. All right. Overall, some amount of unsafety here is we see it as inevitable. Um, after all, we are calling C++ code, right? <laughs> C and C++ code. That code could have undefined behavior. It could just trash the stack. Where if it does that, there's no guarantees that we can possibly maintain, right? We see the goal here as building up a larger and larger base of code that is using Swift safe features, right? So like you know, the safety is incremental, which is not how safety works on a formal level, but on a practical level, it's the best you can do. Like, we're not going to get a world in which all of the code in a process is using safe language is, and not using any unsafe features anytime soon, because it's just too big. Um, so we want using a C++ interface from Swift to at least be as safe as using it from C++ would be. And ideally, safer because we will be enforcing rules on it like exclusivity. So in the C++ code, if it happens to you know, like, benefit from like knowing that like you know things don't change out from under it, which most C++ code does, like that will automatically be guaranteed when the caller is swift. All right. So let's suppose we've got a. Uh, I've got like ten minutes left. Uh, should I rush through these functions, or like, do you want? Oh, uh, so let's suppose we've got a very simple C++ API that returns a vector of strings. In Swift, that's going to get this nice little translation to this. So Swift knows how to work with a C++ value type, like std vector. It's imported to a struct that looks a lot like this. And Swift understands the C++ value semantics of this. So if you copy this type around in Swift, you will call copy constructors. When it goes out of scope, you will call the destructor. Right? It works like you'd expect. And this isn't hard coded for the STL or anything. This is just the default way that we import types. Now, two methods that don't get imported on that type are begin and end. We don't need these in Swift. We can recognize that these container types, that these are container types. And we can import them with a conformance to Swift's collection protocol. It means you automatically get Swift's full set of <coughs> collections algorithms for working with collections on any imported C++ container. And this also sidesteps some major safety pitfalls with the iterator patterns, which I mentioned before do not really fall into anything that we know how to make safe. Not all C++ types are copyable. Swift has advanced ownership features that can express that. Uh, we can import a type like std unique pointer as a non-copyable struct. Uh, we can also understand the data flow directly on that. So when we see that you use uh, one of these non-copyable types in a context that needs an owned value, we will just move it for you. You don't need std move. Right? It's just a very straightforward local analysis that the language can do. <laughs> 
Uh, not all C++ classes are meant to be used as value types, like the core graphics example. It's common to only pass some classes indirectly. Uh, idiomatically, these are all often wrapped in smart pointers. Uh, again, we can annotate these classes so that they're imported as managed or unsafe class types. Right? And we'll understand how to work with them correctly given that annotation. There's a lot of work here still to be done, though. Um, I need to wrap up. Uh, I want to talk through one example of where we've been using uh, C++ plus interoperation, which is the Foundation DB project. Foundation DB is an open source distributed key value database. It's implemented primarily in C++. It's about half a million lines of code. And we've been working for a few months to introduce Swift into it. There's a PR up now. Uh, it works. So here's a C++ type class that's defined in a header. It's meant to be used as a reference type, so we throw an annotation on it. And it will be become a class type when we import it into Swift. Here's the Swift code that uses that type. It's directly accessing the fields that it declared. And this function can be exported right back uh, to uh, some object C++ code, which I don't actually have a slide. Sorry. Um, and this, right. So, I don't want to give the impression that all of this work is complete. So we, it is in a usable state. Um, it's a little bit uh, like a lot of the specifics and the ergonomics around this are still in flight and still being improved. Right? Uh, if you look at that actual foundation DBPR, you'll see a lot of boilerplate that we think we know how to eliminate. But it, right now, it's still there. Um, but it, so this is something that is going to get better. But it works today, and we are moving forward with it. And we see that as the key. We have billions of lines of code invested in our predecessor languages. They are not, those, that code is not going away, and we need to do what we can to improve that code and improve the safety story for that code. But these predecessor languages have problems that we don't know how to solve, and we, really we don't think can be solved. And we're not going to let those languages hold us back. There are better languages out, out there. Swift is one of them. And we need to move forward. Thanks.